Afghanistan-Tajikistan border foreshadows the history-making violence to come. Two Arab journalists travel to the headquarters of the anti-Taliban resistance for a television interview with Northern Alliance leader Ahmed Shah Massoud. Massoud's friend Fahim Dashti hopes to get some good footage for the documentary he's making about Massoud's life. When I heard that the two Arabs went to interview Commandant Massoud, I took my camera and I went with them together. The Arab journalists carry a letter of recommendation, supposedly from London's Islamic Observation Center. But the letter is a fake. In fact, it was composed on a Kabul computer, frequently used by Dr. Ayman al-Zawahiri, second in command of the terrorist group Al-Qaeda. When Massoud asks what the interview will be about, the so-called reporters answer Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and Osama bin Laden. Everyone who'd be happiest to see the Northern Alliance leader dead. Then the interview begins, and the reporters spring their deadly trap. I was busy with my camera. I heard the voice of explosion. A bomb hidden in the Arab reporter's camera instantly kills the cameraman and rips through the rest of the room. My eyes was closed, and I feel that I, I burn my hands, my face, my legs. Masood has also been hit. He and Fahim Dashti are both airlifted to a hospital in Tajikistan. But it's a week later before Dashti hears any news about the Northern Alliance commander. In that night, my brother came and said, just be beside me and told me that they're going to make a museum for chief. I said, what are you talking about? What is the necessity to make a museum for a life person? Then he did not say anything and he cried. And this was saying, this cry was saying me everything. And I feel that we lost the real leader for Afghanistan. Who ordered Massoud's murder? No one really knows for sure. But today, the former Taliban spokesman insists that Mullah Omar and the Taliban had no hand in the assassination. It was politic, and the Taliban denied that they were involved. And if the Taliban knows about it, they will not deny it, because Massoud was an enemy of the Taliban, and they wanted to kill him. Taliban members allege that bin Laden and al-Qaeda acted alone. Killing Massoud was bin Laden's way of repaying Mullah Omar for protecting him, says former Taliban Wahid Mosday. Osama thought he should do something, that if they killed Ahmad Shah Massoud, then the war in Afghanistan would come to an end, and none of the Taliban would be able to say that Osama's presence here was of no benefit to them. Osama is in Afghanistan, in his last days, Massoud had traveled through Europe warning world leaders that the partnership of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban was a threat not just to Afghanistan, but the entire world. Now, it's too late. Al-Qaeda's deadly attacks on New York and Washington put Osama bin Laden and his Taliban protectors in the crosshairs of a deeply wounded superpower hungry for reprisal. On September 20th, 2001, U.S. President George Bush issues Mullah Omar an ultimatum. Tonight, the United States of America makes the following demands on the Taliban. Deliver to United States authorities all the leaders of Al-Qaeda who hide in your land. Facing an impending American attack, the Taliban hold a high-level meeting to weigh their options. Mullah Zaif attends. I wanted to convince Mullah Muhammad Omar for some way of solution because I was confident that in Afghanistan will be destroyed, captured by America. Omar's closest confidants say the Taliban leader is completely unprepared to deal with the crisis. The Taliban did not know that bin Laden was planning these attacks. Mullah Muhammad Omar swear that he said I didn't know about September 11 and who was behind after that. 
Omar refuses to take the U.S. allegations against bin Laden seriously until he has a chance to ask him about them himself. He said, I called to Osama bin Laden and I met with him. I told him, you are in war with that or not. Osama bin Laden, uh, Omar. Osama said that he had not had a hand in the matter. He said the plan had not been made in Afghanistan and that what the U.S. was saying was not true. It was just to put pressure on the Taliban. Omar and bin Laden's relationship has been complicated from the beginning. They are strong allies, but bin Laden occasionally acts without the Taliban's knowledge or tacit permission. Still, Omar hesitates to turn over the al-Qaeda leader to the United States without clear proof of his crimes. And Mr. Mohammed Omar said, uh, this is not suitable for us to do this kind of treatment with our brother. He said, without any evidence and proof, I'm not able to excite Osama. That was his uh, policy, which he was explaining in front of me. Omar decides to abide by his Pashtun upbringing. Bin Laden is his guest, and when Pashtuns receive a guest, they are bound by honor to protect them with their life. Mullah Omar said, half of Afghanistan was destroyed by the Russians, and if the other half is destroyed by Osama, I'm ready for it. Omar tells the Taliban to ready for jihad, holy war against America. October 7, 2001, the United States launches Operation Enduring Freedom, a military campaign to depose the Taliban regime, destroy al-Qaeda, and capture or kill Mullah Omar and Osama bin Laden. What the United States did was capitalize on internal opposition to the extremists of the Taliban by sending small groups of uh, special forces into the country to help organize these opposition groups. Elite American commandos and unchallenged U.S. air power now support Massoud's army. The Northern Alliance moves swiftly through the countryside, hunting down Taliban and al-Qaeda positions and summoning death from above. Mazari Sharif is the first city to fall. Afterwards, U.S. troops and the Northern Alliance liberate the cities of Herat and Kabul in quick succession. Less than a month later, U.S. forces overtake Kandahar, Mullah Omar's headquarters, and the final Taliban holdout. They came to my house and they captured me for one year, ten months. I was in the detention of America until I was released from Guantanamo. American troops take Taliban and Al-Qaeda prisoners by the truckload and ship them off to an uncertain future as enemy combatants. But Osama bin Laden manages to escape. Mullah Omar also eludes U.S. forces, despite a $10 million bounty on his head. With Kandahar under siege, the Taliban leader manages a transmission to his followers. The Mullah Muhammad Omar called that he will be continuing struggle for his life. When he was talking with, with the Taliban by Takiwaki radio, he called to the right now, we should be quiet and we should be again in the ground in the, against the America. Omar tells the Taliban to put down their guns and go back to their homes until the time is right. He promises to wage an insurgent campaign against the foreigners. Then Omar vanishes into hiding. People were saying Taliban are history. Taliban are gone. We fell for the, what foreign invaders in Afghanistan always fall for. We take the cities, and we took that as the sign of victory. And now Taliban have had five years to basically regroup and rearm and retrain.
With the Taliban gone, the Afghan people welcome American troops as liberators. Hope seems to have finally arrived in Afghanistan. Children fly kites, women reveal their faces, and girls attend school. All these things had been banned under the repressive Taliban regime. In 2004, Afghanistan holds triumphant national elections. Hamid Karzai is voted president. Karzai is a popular ethnic Pashtun with strong ties to the revered monarchy. His job is to govern a country demolished by 20 consecutive years of fighting. It will be an uphill climb. Karzai loses the public's confidence every day he can't provide poor, hungry Afghans with basic social services. Do we have good health services in this country? No. These streets, these ditches, full of filth and sicknesses. Can you call this as the real life? Everybody was thinking we should lead this society towards democracy as soon as possible. But if you don't give somebody a piece of bread, how can he feel democracy is better than dictatorship? When he doesn't see a change in his life, how can he believe Karzai is better than Mullah Omar? Karzai's popular support quickly fades. Afghans are especially angry about the makeup of his parliament, which includes several notorious figures from Afghanistan's past. There are former communists from the days of the brutal Soviet occupation, notorious Mujahideen warlords from the Civil War era, and even several former Taliban. Ahmed Karzai has said that Taliban are also Afghanistan's children, and they must be brought into the mainstream. But many Afghans refuse to be ruled by men with blood on their hands. Karzai struggles to extend the reach of his government beyond Kabul. Outside of the capital, Afghans watch many of the country's same old problems resurface. Drug smuggling, gun running, and warlordism. Local commanders empowered by Karzai to help with security are instead linked to serious human rights abuses. A U.S.-led coalition tries to keep the peace, but only manages to slow Afghanistan's descent into chaos. Some Afghans actually argue that they were safer under the Taliban. The Taliban did bring law and order, and that is a very highly valued commodity in Afghanistan. For five years after the American invasion, the Taliban quietly waited for new orders from Mullah Muhammad Omar. Just before he vanished into hiding, Omar promised to wage an insurgent campaign against the U.S. In 2006, the Taliban make good on his promise. We thought the Taliban are finished. But now, after five years, we are in big trouble. Security forces into this dangerous region 